Steve Cohen, who is here with us today, is known as the Millionaire's Magician. Uh, he's the star of the Chamber Magic Show, which is on at the New York Palace Hotel, which I have been to see, and it's fantastic. Highly recommended. Um, it's celebrating its 20th anniversary this year, which is uh, incredible, and it's had more than half a million people see it. Um, he's performed, the Millionaire's Magician, he's performed for royalty, billionaires, uh, movie stars, all kinds of other people, and I'm really, really thrilled uh, to have him here with us today. Uh, but first, I will also introduce uh, his co-creator of Chamber Magic, Mark Levy, who is a strategy consultant, and he is going to say a few words initially. My name is Mark Levy, and I am one of the two co-creators of the show Chamber Magic. The other co-creator is Steve Cohen, the millionaire's magician. In a moment, he's going to be standing right here and doing magic for you. But before he does that, what I would like to do is I'd like to ask you a few questions. And by the way, your answers may influence which trick Steve does. It's a little choose your own adventure kind of thing going. So first, how many people here have ever seen a magician perform in person? Not on TV or YouTube or whatnot. Steve, what percentage is that? I'm interested. 99. Oh, wow. A very advanced group. Where did you see a magician? Like, what was the venue? What was... Oh, my gosh. I've seen a lot. I've seen Steve Cohen. Oh, you've seen... It, so you went to chamber. All right. We have a ringer. You, sir, where did you see a magician? Uh, I saw Darren Brown two nights ago. Darren Brown two nights ago. Who else? Yes. I saw Darren Brown also. <laughs> oh, okay. Gotcha. All right. Great. So a very advanced group here. Second question. Those of you who have seen a magician in person, how many of you have participated in a trick? You were asked to select a card, they read your mind, something like that. How many people actually participate in a trick? We got one person back there, two, four. What was the trick that you participated in and what was your role? Um, I participated in Steve Cohen's trick where he takes the wedding ring. <laughs> Them around a glass and attaches them oh, okay. So, all right, great. And so, what did you do? You I gave him the ring. You gave him a ring. Great. How about yourself? Uh, I, in David Kwong's show, I was asked to like answer some questions, and then they appeared later in the show. You were asked to answer questions, and they appeared later in the show. Beautiful. Thank you for that. My third and final question, and again, Steve is calibrating everything that he's hearing right now. My third and final question is, how many of you consider yourselves magicians? That maybe you did a lot of magic when you were a kid, and even though you haven't done magic in a very long time, you still associate with being a magician, or maybe you've done magic all along, or maybe you picked it up late in life. Maybe you consider this Google thing to be a little side hustle for you. <laughs> And you actually consider yourself a magician first. How many people are magicians in here? No one. Am I seeing that right? Zero. OK, cool. So Steve, thank you all for participating. Steve, based on what it was I was seeing, and I didn't have as good a view as you, I'm thinking that for your opening trick that you might either do, and tricks, by the way, have names. All tricks have names. You might do a dollar and 31 cents through the tabletop, or that trick that we've actually never officially named, but we call it uh, um, uh, the Queen of Morocco trick. So one of those, I'm thinking, unless you have another option that I think you're we thinking. Go with the Queen of Morocco. Qu why Queen of Morocco? Just based on the audience's response and the sight lines from that angle over there. Okay, okay well, good. Yeah. Right, sight lines are important. All right. So in order to do this trick, because Steve performs in very intimate close-up surroundings, let's get a few people up here on stage to act as a further audience. <laughs> Steve, you want to help me here? Over here. Leave your computers. And over here, maybe the lady in the white and the gentleman right behind her? Right there. Perfect. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, Steve Cohen, the millionaire's magician, and the queen of Morocco trick.
Thank you very much. Thank you so much. May I come amongst you? Uh, thanks so much. If you could come in a little bit, yeah, right over here on the spot, the X right under the big safe that's going to drop on your head. That's wonderful. Okay, terrific. Well, this is actually not something that I typically do, but uh, since based on your responses, I think it'll be perfect for all of you. Uh, this is a trick that I got a chance to perform for the Queen of Morocco. Now, um, I don't often get a chance to, uh, to perform for royalty, so this is a kind of a thrill uh, for me. And I need someone amongst you here to act as the Queen of Morocco. So, um, what do you think? Do you want to be queen for a day? That sounds great. Okay, this is terrific. So this happened at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, where I used to uh, perform my show Chamber Magic. And, um, and so I asked the queen of Morocco, the actual queen, to shuffle a deck of playing cards. So I put the cards onto the table, and she didn't pick them up. Instead, she just kind of nodded to someone. It was a servant who walked over. <laughs> He picks up the cards and starts shuffling them and giving them a good mix. And my head is starting to think really fast now on the fly. I think, how do I do this? Because in fact, for this trick to work, theatrically, the cards have to be shuffled and cut by the queen. So I thought, okay, uh, here's, here's my plan. Your majesty. And I never call anyone your majesty except for my own wife. <laughs> I, think, I need you to help me out. Can you please cut about a quarter of the deck and put them onto the table? So please do that right now. About a quarter of the deck and put them onto the table. Right about over there is a good spot. That's wonderful. Oh, that was very good, Your Majesty. Can you please do it again? Cut off another quarter of the deck. Very good, and put them right next to it, right over there. Wonderful. And remember, these cards have been shuffled, uh, of course, by, by her servant. Uh, can you please now cut off <laughs> another quarter of the deck? Put them right over here next to it. Very good. And then the big question is, uh, would you like to shuffle the cards yourself, or would you like to designate one of your friends here? Who would you like to shuffle the cards, or not? I will designate a friend. OK, so who do you want to shuffle? Second person down. OK, so please go ahead and shuffle those cards. Give them a good mix. Very good. And once you've shuffled and cut those cards, I think he's the best shuffler in the kingdom. <laughs> This is wonderful. Thank you very much. I wasn't planning that, but you did a fine job. And can you, Your Majesty, one final cut, cut about a third or whatever is left, and just put those, or any number is fine, and put those into the fourth spot. Wonderful. So now is where the magic begins. Do you remember, Your Majesty, the cards have been shuffled. The cards have been cut by people you designated. You imbued some of your magic royalty into these cards. Would you please now come over here and turn over the top card that you cut to? Turn it over right now, please, and show the people. A queen. The queen has cut to a queen. Mm -hmm. Now please turn over the second one. Go ahead. Oh my gosh. Another queen. <laughs> and the third? And the last? Whoa. The queen of Morocco cut to all four queens. And you shuffled the cards yourself. You gave them a good mix. Exactly. And as I was putting these cards away, uh, the Queen of Morocco leaned into me and she said, uh, she said, Mr. Cohen, that's extraordinary. I'm going to need to invite you to, uh, to my country so you could perform that for my husband. And uh, when, I looked, when she said that, I said, well, no problem. But when he cuts the cards, he'll cut to all four kings. <laughs> Now, uh, as Mark mentioned, and as Andrew uh, mentioned earlier, I do a show in New York called Chamber Magic. Uh, the show's been running now for 20 years. And I'd like to share with you something that I performed as a boy because of my uncle's influence. My uncle was an amateur magician. I'll tell you about him later. But in order to do this, why don't you squeeze in a little bit closer? And you could also squeeze in a lot closer. So you yeah, walk, actually walk in a little bit closer. So you can yeah, walk in over here so you can see. Good. And uh, that should be just fine. Uh, and uh, you can stay back, actually. It's a better spot there. <laughs> I don't trust you. I trust her, not you. Very good. This is the very coin given to me by my uncle. Uh, it's a pure silver dollar, a Morgan dollar. The reason I wanted you to come closer so you can see the head on the front, correct? Mm -hmm. And the reverse side, tell us, what do you see? Eagle. What is it? A griffin or an eagle? A griffin or an eagle. <laughs> what country are you from? <laughs> <laughs> He's from Morocco. <laughs> Terrific. Oh, welcome. A <laughs> big trip. Uh, no, you were right the first time. Uh, it's uh, heads on one side, tails on the other. We'll use the lady and the eagle, as well as a griffin. It's <laughs> a magic show. <laughs> exactly. It's a hippogriff. Okay. Can you please hold on to the hat and make sure it's empty? You can take a look. Make sure it's empty. Yep. Yeah. It was pretty empty. Yeah. That was thorough. Yeah, it's not CSI. You're doing fine. <laughs> Here, Your Majesty, put your, both of your hands out like so. I want you to hold on to the brim of the hat and just shake it a few times so people down there can see nothing falls out. It's an empty hat, and now you can simply stay put. So thank you. I'm going to spin this coin on the table. Uh, while it's spinning, she'll place the hat on top of the spinning coin. You'll leave the hat on the table and then step back to your spot. It's okay. super simple. Okay. So here we go. The coin is now spinning. Drop the hat on top quick. Ooh, that was pretty good. At this point, the coin has landed. It's either heads up or tails up, and I'm not sure which, however... I could help you miss. Guess correctly every time, whether it's heads or tails, 
What do you think? Heads. She says heads. If it's heads, I leave it as is to match her choice. But if it's tails, now I can make the coin flip over to match her choice without touching the hat, the table, or the coin. Good trick? Yes. How many people here believe what I just said? <laughs> Yeah, I'm not even sure myself. Everyone, please come in really close, really lean in so you can see this yourself. How do we do? Heads or tails? How do we do? Tails. Okay, but there's a bird that has a head. It's a griffin that's got a head. Oh, that one. <laughs> it's a little tiny head with a little beak on it, you know? She's too smart for me. I tried to trick her. I failed. We're going to play this game again. In fact, we'll keep on doing this until you like it. <laughs> We'll be here until next Wednesday at this rate. Uh, here's the second trick of my uncle. He called this the vanishing silver dollar trick. The coin will disappear, he would say, but you won't see it go, no matter how closely you watch. Push it in. I used to follow it up like this, it's back. <laughs> when you're six years old, that's kind of a miracle, it really is. But you know, we're all grown-ups here. I'll show you to the way it should have looked when we were children. In other words, if magic truly existed, hopefully it would have looked something as beautiful as this. Oh, you're very kind, but would you be impressed if the coin reappeared back under the hat? Yes. This time, heads up. She's like, yes, must be his, definitive answer. <laughs> He's thinking 50-50, <laughs> This guy's like, I'd be more impressed if there's a brick under the head. <laughs> you would? Pick it up, Miss Fast, you can pick it up, quick, quick, go. <laughs> <laughs> you want a brick? We'll give you a brick, it's a real brick under the hat. I don't know how we did it, we did it together. A brick under the hat, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Exactly, and um, this guy over here is very skeptical. I could tell in his eyes. He's been looking at me like, it was there the whole time. <laughs> Everybody missed it but me. <laughs> See if you can fit that inside of your sleeve, sir. Does it fit up your sleeve when I give it a try? This is Lululemon, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> you just gave, gave a nice plug for Lululemon. <laughs> Excellent. And now, uh, finally, I did mention before uh, about some magic that my uncle used to perform, my uncle being an amateur magician. Uh, this is uh, something which, which uh, has been passed on to me. He would always gather the children around our table and uh, at our family gatherings, and he would ask us to really watch the table surface. So in order to recreate that, I, I, this is the old green mat he used to use, made it feel like a poker surface, a uh, poker table. And we'll do this with, uh, with uh, perhaps, can you shuffle cards? Not so well. Not so well. Can you change places with, uh, with this fellow right over here then? Can you shuffle cards? It's assumed, uh, yeah. Oh yeah, I assumed. Okay. I made an assumption. And over here, can you shuffle a deck yeah. of cards? Very good. And and you guys are uh, not as much. Okay, that's that's fine. Okay, <laughs> no problem. What you're about to witness then is not magic, but a conundrum. Several people have told me it's so disturbing they can't fall asleep at night. If you have any trouble with what you're about to see, say stop, and we'll all go home. But if you like what you see, please say continue, and we'll continue. I'm glad you said that. We're just getting started. We're going to begin over here. Uh, you said you can shuffle a deck of playing cards. And what is your first name? Anella. Anella, I got it. Anella, can you please, do people call you Annie? No. Okay, I know someone named Anella. <laughs> <laughs> I know someone who's named Anella who people call Annie. Oh. How special. So Anella, would you please shuffle the cards on the tabletop? Uh, let's get a close up so people can see that she's shuffling. And um, okay, you know, um, the Anella I knew knew how to shuffle, okay. but okay. okay. All right. <laughs> No problem. So that was a pretty decent job. And actually, you know, the easier part is cutting them. Can you just cut the cards, please? So she shuffles and she cuts. Oh, usually the dealer replaces, oh, but that's sorry, okay. Sorry. We're breaking protocol. <laughs> that's fine. So can you please ask to knock the deck, dun dun, and then you can just pump pump like this, and then step back and, you know, like actually. Oh, actually knock. Okay. That's yeah, it's called the, the dun dun, exactly, like in Japanese. Same thing over here on this side. And your name is? Steven. Oh, that's, do you spell it with a V or a PH? A V. A V. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the correct spelling. Very good. Never understood the pH. Okay, so Stephen, can you please shuffle the cards like she did on the tabletop? Just do your best. You know, she's giving lessons after the show. Yeah, I'll take it. Okay, very good. And Stephen, can you also cut the cards in half? Very good. You want to cut them again? Sure. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> He's thinking, it's free. <laughs> Very good. And now please knock the deck, dun dun, and you can step back in line over here next to Her Majesty. The cards have been shuffled on both sides. Shall we stop or continue? Continue. 
Now we begin. Okay, I need someone to help me and you seem like you're eager to help. Can you please tell me a color, red or black, which do you prefer? Red. We'll remove the red cards because he said so. Now watch this, let's find some red cards. In fact, let's find them all. As I remove the red cards, you may be wondering why I asked these people to join me or why I beckoned the rest of you closer. It's because sometimes I become careless. I might miss one or two red cards. So folks, especially over my shoulder, if I miss one, tell me, we'll go back to pull it out. But I think that we're all clear. And can you just double check? No extra red cards? Mm -hmm. All clear over here? Terrific? Okay, I believe you. Very good. The red cards will return to you very soon, so please push all of the red cards inside the box there, Stephen. Push them all the way down, and then close the lid, and put them into your back pocket. Have you got a, a, some space in your back pocket? Yeah. Just tuck those in your back pocket. Good, same thing over here. Uh, the color call, once again, was? Red. Red it is. We'll pull out the red cards over here. And uh, I know this takes a bit of time, but I can assure you the ratio of buildup to effect <laughs> is high. <laughs> We're not waste your time. Very good. Uh, and uh, a bunch of computer scientists gets that joke. No one else gets that joke. Here we go. Put all the red cards and a few more here, a few more here. And uh, boy, this is a very thorough shuffle over here. Anella, I am super impressed. Um, double check. Can you come in a little closer here? What do you think? Are, the, are we all clear? All clear. No extra red cards? Good. And you've got a very fuzzy jacket. Are there pockets? Are there pockets? Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Okay. So uh, please take the box over here. And we need to fill up the box first. These are the cards you shuffled yourself, correct? So why don't you push those inside, push them all the way down, close the lid, and put them into your fuzzy pocket so no one can touch them. Good. The cards have been shuffled on both sides. Shall we stop or continue? Continue. Finally, we begin. Last warning. Make sure of you, over my shoulder that you can see and for our cameras that you can see what's happening here. Now, Anella, you begin. Please cut off about half of the cards. Would you put them right over here, please? Are you nervous? Uh, no, but I just shake all the time. Okay, no, no problem, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm around you too. Oh, good. Same thing over here, Anella. Let's take a look. She randomly cuts to here a black nine, the nine of spades. The nine of spades will place uh, here, so it's crossways. And then on this side, you shuffled these cards, didn't you? Mm -hmm. And you shuffled them in inordinate amount, right? More than you needed to. Yes. I understand. We're going to pluck individual cards off the top of each deck. As my hands move, they move in a rhythm left and right at the same pace. As we go down the line, they're different each time until here, when something peculiar happens. A perfect match. Shall we stop or continue? <laughs> That's just the first coincidence. We'll try this again. In fact, I'd like it very much this time. If someone else can shuffle, um, excuse me, um, can you come in a little bit closer and shuffle the cards yourself? Shuffle both decks together. Yeah, why not? I'm feeling crazy today. Very good. Yo, oh, with the bridge. <laughs> did, you, did you bring your custom pool cue too? <laughs> He's a ringer. Okay, he made a rainbow of colors. Now hopefully the overhead camera can see that it's a real mishmash of colors. With your uh, right, or left hand rather, hold on to my wrist. Hold on to my wrist over here. And hold on to my wrist on this side. Thank you, just watch the watch, I'm a collector. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> and um, uh, your majesty, your chance to please uh, tell us a number between one and 15 allowed. Two. Two, oh, oh. that's like the lower limits. Okay, and, and would you like the color red or blue? Blue, because he's choosing blue, two. Thank you. <laughs> Watch closely. I count number one and number two. Oh, it happens to be blue, which is great. Okay, so we'll slide out the second blue card. Can you agree? Yes. Okay, keep holding. On your side, we'll count uh, from the other end, over here with my fingers, and uh, we'll start with the reds this time. That's number one, and that's number two. Now, if she had said a higher number, we would count 11, 12, 13, 14, but this is uh, very close to the beginning, and very close to the beginning, but has there been anything tricky on your side? Not yet. Or here? Then let go of me. <laughs> <laughs> She's tighter, but thank you. I appreciate that. I know. And after all the shuffling and mixing, what are the odds these specific two? What? Wow. <laughs> are a perfect match. You're very kind, but shall we stop or continue? Continue. continue. Now, over our heads, we have some uh, very strong lamps. These lamps will help in the final stage of this experiment. I shall place the cards into two piles, one on the left and one on the right. After all the shuffling and mixing, after all the cuts and the extra cut and the fancy pants shuffle, which I wasn't expecting, sir. After all that, hopefully the shadows created by the lamp overhead will change everything. Ladies and gentlemen, please, crane your necks in. Watch these shadows. Ha, ha, ha.
It's done. After all the shuffling, the top two now. And the bottom. And the next, and the next, and the next. In fact, my friends, every card, that's the kings, the jacks, twos, seven, queen, two, four, ace of spades, the nine of clubs, every card here, every card here. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me today. Take a bow. Oh, no. You're very kind. Shall we stop or continue? I totally forgot. Get the cameras back on. Please, you had them uh, in your pocket, in your fuzzy pocket. Open that box up and take them out. And if we get the cameras back on, please, if you could take the cards out of your pocket as well, please open up the box. Remove all the cards from inside. That's right, all the cards from inside over here. The bottom card in his back pocket is the five of hearts. The bottom card in her fuzzy pocket, the five of hearts. <laughs> and the an next. <laughs> And the next, in fact, my friends, every card, that's the jack, nine, eight, seven, three, five, four, the nine of diamonds, every card here, every card here. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for inviting me here today. Oh, shall we stop or continue? continue. Stop. <laughs> thank you so much. Let's give them a nice hand as they go back to their chairs. Thank you so much, Daniela. Stephen, thank thanks you so much for your help. Your Majesty, thank you so much. <laughs> So if you thought that seeing a master perform was the highlight of what you were going to see today, you were wrong. Because the highlight of what you're going to see is two guys sitting in chairs talking about magic tricks in a highly abstracted and philosophical way. That's what we're about to see right now. I'm going to ask Steve questions about his life and about how he creates magic tricks and so forth. He's going to ask me tri uh, questions about how we created the show. And we're also going to open up the floor. You get a chance to ask one of the masters any questions you want about magic. Right? So Steve, please. Oh, and by the way, if you st stay there, don't sit down. Yet. If you hang out, Steve may perform one more trick at the end of the day. So Steve, have a seat. Thank you. All right. So tell us, how did you get started in magic? Well, the, the traditional answer, of course, is I got tricked into it. Um, but the real answer is that my uncle was an amateur magician. Uh, I grew up in Westchester County, about an hour north of here. Um, and uh, my uncle used to come over to all of our family parties and show us card tricks and tricks with coins and hats. Um, and he had a, one trick that he would show us with a, uh, a little knife, a little pocket knife that changed colors, uh, changed from red, red to green to white to black. And, um, and he let me have that knife, which is kind of ridiculous that, you know, for an adult to give a little six-year-old boy a knife right. to run around Different with. Different times. Exactly. Yes. So uh, anyway, so, so he used to perform these pocket tricks and he would teach me his, his pocket tricks. But he taught them to me in a way that was pretty funny. Um, you know, he, we, we always had these family parties with, with people smoking cigarettes. And so when he would make a coin, for example, disappear in his hand, it looked like it disappeared into a puff of smoke. Because the whole room was full of smoke. But, you know, right, right. My little boy's eyes, it was like he was making the smoke appear when the coin vanished. Um, so so in, any, in any event, my uncle would teach me a trick like the coin trick. And then he would say, if you master this, next time we have another party, I'll teach you the next trick. So he kind of strung me along, um, and, and one by one, little by little, it, it, it was built up on top of it. It was like an apprenticeship, in an, right? In a or a drug dealer, I don't know. Right, 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 right. <laughs> one or the other. Um, but yeah, but so in any event, um, so, so I performed magic shows in my hometown uh, for little birthday parties. So the children would uh, you know, they have a four-year-old birthday party. I was 10 years old. I got hired, and I did a $25 gig uh, at the age of 10. Uh, people paid me to come and perform for their son. It was a four-year-old boy. I'll never forget his name, because it was my first show. His name was Daniel Gerstenzang. How can you forget that name? So if Daniel Gersenzang is watching this, hello. Uh, thank you for starting <laughs> right, off my career. Right. Um, but in any event, uh, you know, there's different types of, of training for magicians. And probably one of the best is uh, a magic summer camp uh, that takes place. It's been going on for over 30 years, um, maybe actually over 40 years now. 
And uh, I went to this summer camp. Now, you know there's basketball camp and baseball camp, ballet camp, uh, but there's actually a camp for magicians. And uh, there's all these kind of nerdy kids like me uh, who wanted to learn magic. And the, and the counselors are all professional magicians. So I got a chance to, to learn from some of the best. Oh, wow. Speaking of learning from some of the best, when, when you talk to magicians about who their heroes are, you always hear the same names like Houdini and so forth. I mean, and these are heroic figures. But I know you also, um, you love certain magicians that the general public has really just not heard of too much. Tell us about one of them and maybe something odd that this magician does. Sure. Well, um, one of my favorite magicians that the audience would not be familiar with, unless you're already a, a magician yourself, um, is Max Malini, which his name, his name rhymes with Houdini, so it has a nice ring to it. But uh, Max Malini was, uh, uh, he is my hero. Um, he performed magic for kings and queens. He performed for uh, billionaires of his day, the Vanderbilt family. Uh, and he used to go around the world performing it with a little satchel. And all of his, his entire act would fit inside of the satchel. And uh, he, for example, pioneered the idea of pulling the brick out of the hat, the one that I just showed to this audience. Uh, although he didn't do it with a brick coming out of the hat all the time, sometimes he would have other things come out of the hat. So uh, he had a brick of ice, like a giant block of ice that came out. You may have heard in Ricky Jay's uh, documentary, the wonderful documentary right. by Ricky Jay's life, uh, that he performed that trick with the block of ice, uh, as have I, as influenced both of us by Max Malini. Uh, I've also done it like Malini has done with a coconut coming out of the hat when I did the show in Hawaii. Uh, and also an alarm alarm clock, where those old-fashioned alarm clocks have the little bell that rings back right. and forth with the hammer. The moment you lift up the hat, then it starts right. to ring and everyone goes crazy. Right. Uh, so, so anyways, Max Malini was uh, also famous for being very gutsy. Uh, he was a short little guy, probably about five foot one, five foot two, very thick Eastern European accent. Um, and uh, when he wanted to make an impact on people, he would sometimes get into their personal space in a way that may not have been comfortable <laughs> for the victim. Um, one of the things he did and he's most well known for is uh, he was in Washington, D.C. Uh, he wanted to try to get an in to the White House. He wanted to figure out how he could perform for the president, uh, President Teddy Roosevelt at the time. So, I'm uh, oh, sorry, it was actually Harding, President Harding. And so, so he figured he had to get a, in through the side door. The way he did that was going to Congress. He found a senator, a U.S. senator. He says, excuse me, Mr. Senator. And he grabs the, the senator's arm, and he bites off the button from the senator's sleeve. And he pulls the button out of his mouth, and the threads are dangling down. And then, the, you know, the, of course, security back then is different than it is now. Um, but he says, Mr. Senator, it's no problem. I am Max Malini, the magician. And he takes the button and then reattached it to the sleeve. And it was sewn back on. Magically. Magically, magically. Right. Um, and so that was actually his entree into performing in the White House, oh. uh, which he got the invitation later that week. Oh, wow. What's like a piece of philosophy from Malini that guides you or that you think people would be interested in? Um, Malini's most well-known phrase is to wait a week. Now, remember, he had a very thick uh, Europe, Eastern European accent. So when he says wait a week, it was wait a week. Uh, the W has become V's. And what he means by that, or what he meant by that, was, you know, magic often relies on misdirection uh, or directing the audience's attention from one area to another. Uh, if the audience is burning your hands, that's what we call it in the, right. in, the, in the jargon in the business, if the audience is burning your hands, it's very difficult to do sleight of hand tricks. How can you possibly, you know, throw a coin into your jacket or something up your sleeve, you know, if, if everyone's watching? So, a famous magician named Charlie Miller asked Max Malini, what do you do if people are burning your hands? And he says, I wait. And then M Charlie Miller says, how long do you wait? He says, I'll wait a week. <laughs> and so meaning like, you know, you have to be patient to do things on your terms as opposed to the audience's terms. Right, interesting. Um, when, did you, uh, when did you start Chamber Magic and how did you go about starting Chamber Magic? Well, you know the answer because you were right there with me. I was there. Uh, so the show began 20 years ago. I'm waiting to see if you mention me. Yeah. <laughs> I, everything else, I'm not paying exactly. any attention. Exactly. <laughs> uh, this is the Mark Levy show now. Right. Um, so, so uh, you know, the show began 20 years ago. We began working on it 21 years ago. Uh, and I began the show actually in my friend's apartment here in New York City. Um, it was originally intended to be kind of a, a small show for about 20, 30 people maximum. And my friend down in the West Village had this beautiful apartment that was decorated with a Victorian theme. So he said, if you'd like to come and do a show in my apartment, you're welcome to do it, which we 
did. We rearranged the furniture and I invited some of my clients in, some of my friends, and I put on these shows for a few weeks. The problem was his wife then said, you can't keep on inviting strangers into our house. Uh, and in rearranging the furniture every week, you know, the management of our building started to ask questions. So, um, so I moved the show from there to the National Arts Club in Gramercy Park. Um, it's a private members club for artists, so the place is just beautiful. Uh, there's stained glass windows and there's beautiful members artwork on the wall. Um, and they also support performing arts. So I convinced the owners, the, the management there, to let me do chamber magic uh, there. And this is a full collaboration between you and me with all the, the, the concepts in the show. Uh, and at the very end of that run, which was about two or three months, uh, the management said, look, you have to find a new venue because we close for the summer. So now I'm out on the street wondering what am I going to do? But at that last show, I thought, I've got an idea. I'll ask the audience. I'll crowdsource this. I'll say, who in this audience knows any place I might be able to perform after this venue closes for the summer? And one lady came up to me. She said, uh, her name is Holly Pepe, and Holly uh, uh, happened to know people who worked at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. And she introduced me to the director of catering. Uh, and the director of catering says, no, 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 we don't do magic here. This is the Waldorf Astoria. And, I, and my new friend Holly said, no, you have to just trust me. It's not just a regular magic show. You really have to see this. So uh, I got invited to perform in the, uh, the Royal Suite on the 42nd floor. is where the Duke and Duchess of Windsor used to live. And I performed there. Uh, as a trial for the first few weekends and then stayed there for the next 16 and a half years uh, performing over 4,750 shows there. So the big question I'm going to switch back to you because I know you're eager to speak <laughs> is um, what type of thinking did you do because you're a differentiation guy like you work with right. uh, of course you know you know magic and you're a magician yourself but you also work with consultants and helping them differentiate themselves. How did you help me create a show that was appropriate for that venue. Right, so differentiation, right, everyone knows what that is. It's, it's what's the core of what this thing is that we're looking at, the business or so, and how do we talk about, how do we, what's the thing that best separates it from everything around it, and then how do you talk about it and write about mm -hmm. it in a clear, engaging way? So with you, uh, like what makes this special? So with you, I remember I saw you perform. I thought you were brilliant, and but you didn't perform the way you do now, right? You weren't dressed this way. You didn't do the same tricks, right? He had a very different show, and he he dressed more like a normal person, unlike uh, a, a very upscale guy. So I realized after, like, Steve really had the chops, but also he went to Cornell, like he was super smart. He grew up in Chappaqua, New York, which is a very moneyed area. There are millionaires there or whatnot. And I realized looking around the magic scene that there were people like Penn and Teller, who were the bad boys of magic, and David Blaine, you know, who's the street magician or whatnot. And I realized that no one was doing magic for the filthy rich. <laughs> like the decadently sickly rich, you know, right? That's how differentiation people think. It's like you go, you go to an extreme. It's like, so I said, this guy, I think, you know, he's sophisticated enough. We need to change how he dresses. We need to change how the show happens and what the illusions are and so forth. But I think he could be that guy. And so we made him Steve Cohen, the millionaire's magician, entertainment for exclusive events. And it was actually a very engineered thing, right? It's, right. it's like, it was strategic. It was like, here's the spot in the marketplace that allows you to be the artist that you want to be, but that would sell in the world. And even when we were designing the show, Steve and I used to talk about the million, right? He's Steve Cohen, the millionaire's magician. We used to talk about the millionaire's magician as independent of us. Like, like a third person, like a third right. party. Right. It's like, oh, yeah, the millionaire's magician wouldn't do that. I think the millionaire's magician would do X, right? Correct. Uh, yeah. What's your thinking? What do you have to add? Well, that's 100% right. You know, it was all with the, the intent of being able to uh, remain an artist. Like, it wasn't all engineered, you know, strictly from a, a financial gain uh, perspective. It was really, I wanted to do magic no matter what. 
magic is in my blood. You know, I've been doing it since I was a little boy at age, the age of six. Um, so you know, how can I do magic? How can I make a business that would support my love for this? So I was willing to do anything. And this actually, what Mark suggested to me, what you suggested, was just so uh, up my alley. It just, it felt like it would click. But the nice thing is that even though it was a construct to begin with, I kind of grew into the character. And so, you know, now the things that I wear and the things that I say and the people who I rub shoulders with are the people who I was originally aiming my, my, my marketing toward. Now I feel like I'm one of them. So it actually has made it, I've kind of grown into the, the character that we created. Speaking of that, related to this, at Chamber Magic, at your show, there's a, and this is all you, right? This was not part of me, uh, what I did. Uh, you have a, a strict dress code yep. for Chamber Magic. Tell us what that is and why you decided to do that. Right, so you know, um, the, the dress code was to match the dress code at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel because they've, they had a dress code of, especially in the evenings, of wearing cocktail attire. So we made the show uh, dress code cocktail attire, meaning jackets and ties for gentlemen, dresses or you know fancy outfits for ladies, and uh, I've gotten some pushback for that, or for you know early on especially, where people would say, "Well, I'm not going. This is not a state dinner for the president. How? Why don't you get dressed up for a magic show? Uh, it's just a magic show." Right. And I've paid my money. Exactly. I should, yeah. Be able to wear whatever you like. And yet, if you go to Broadway now, you'll see people wear whatever they want: flip flops or shorts or tank top. People wear whatever they like. Um, but I wanted to create a. An, something that was equivalent to going to the ballet or to the opera. So it was like a destination. And then when you get there and you look around and you say, this is such a beautiful place. Boy, would I feel out of place if I was wearing flip flops or a tank top, you know? So everyone's wearing it. So it kind of makes everyone feel that it's the appropriate attire. And then during the show, I actually thank the audience. I, I show my great, my gratefulness and my appreciation. And I'll say, you know, I want to thank all of you for getting dressed up today, following the dress code. It's not common for people to do so in this day and age, uh, but you look terrific. And then at that, whenever I say that, I always see the girlfriends nudging the boyfriend saying, right, see, right. I told you. And the guy's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, How do you go about creating a magic trick? Um, well, actually, I want, to, I want to ask you your method first. Um, I, have, I know my answer, but I'd like to know, because I know you have a very unusual or peculiar way I do have. of creating magic, so I think people would be interested in hearing oh, that. Oh, yeah. Well, so when I was a kid and I used to perform magic, I was this sleight of hand guy. I did all kinds of coin manipulations and all kinds of things. But then as I started to get older, and I'm talking about when I was a teenager, I started to develop a, a benign tremor. You know, I don't have any disease, you know, Parkinson's or something like that. I don't have any of those. But I have this benign tremor. And it, start, it, got, it started to get worse and worse. And it made it difficult for me. Not only did it make it hard for me to manip manipulate coins or cards, but I couldn't even know if I'd be shaking enough to hold up a glass, if I would be able to do that. So I started to develop a style of magic where I tried to touch the prop, I tried to have as few as props as possible, and I tried to be as far away from the props as possible. Right, and so I approach things, even regular magic tricks, almost like I was a mentalist, almost like I was a mind reader, that it was, you know, that what I was doing was real, that this was mind magic or so, and that kind of aesthetic, because, right, we've created uh, tricks together for chamber magic, uh, that kind of aesthetic I still use to that day. It's usually not these outward shows of manipulation. It's usually, right, it's usually, uh, 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 staying away from the trick, mostly because there's nothing I could do if I was there in front of the prop, right, so right. I might as well stay away. But also the other brilliant thing that I think Mark brings to the table in our collaborations um, is his storytelling ability. So, you know, Mark, is a, he has got the gift of gab. Uh, he loves to talk and tell stories and say things in a very engaging uh, way. Uh, so, so I actually have techniques I can use. So when we were together, a lot of times, I'll find an old trick, something that hasn't been seen maybe for decades or even centuries. And then Mark will say, well, here's how you might want to present that so that it's interesting and more engaging than you thought. And this way actually is a kind of a double layered layer level of interest. You know, my technique plus his storytelling has really created something special. We're like Master Blaster from Beyond Thunderdome. It's like we're two separate things and we go together <laughs> and form one person. Okay. Uh, right, exactly. Right. So. Um, you be Master, I'll be Blaster. Exactly. When you see ma magic tricks done by other magicians, are you fooled? 
Um, I love to be fooled. I'm not often fooled. Um, being fooled is a joy, one of the joys of, of not being a magician, um, that you can, uh, you can watch something which is an artistic expression and then not, uh, not be able to follow the steps and suddenly there's something beautiful, you know, surprising at the end. I wish I could still feel that. It's, it's, it's rarer and rarer the longer I've been in magic. But once in a while, you find a magician who has taken some ideas and combined them in a peculiar way, and suddenly there's something that will even fool the magicians. Um, you know, Penn and Teller's Fool Us, actually, is a show that kind of focuses on that exact concept, which is, can you fool the master of magicians? Um, and as you know, if you've ever watched that show, it's rare that Penn and Teller get fooled. When they do, it's a big brouhaha, a big, you know, a big uh, fanfare. So it's a similar thing for me. I, don't often get fooled, but I love to be fooled. Right. Um, do you ever, when you perform, you've performed in Carnegie Hall, you've performed on TV, you've performed for royalty, do you ever get nervous? Um, the most nervous I've gotten, actually there's two instances that come to mind. One of them was when Woody Allen came to the show uh, at the Waldorf, and I grew up watching Woody Allen's films. So seeing him there front and center, uh, right there in the front center seat, and uh, when I walked out and saw him there, I kind of went into a fight or flight mode where my hands started getting all clammy and my tongue got all dry, and I was like, oh my God, this is going to be a big failure. But at the moment I started the show, he started laughing and clapping more than everyone else even. I think it's because he was an amateur magician or a young a magician in his early days uh, doing the stage, uh, his, his club sets. So uh, anyway, so he was really supportive and that put my anxiety at ease. But the, probably the biggest um, fear that I ever had was when I went on the David Letterman show, uh, the late show David Letterman, and I remember you were there. I don't think you remember this because you saw me after I got my makeup put on. Uh, but I went down to the makeup room and the, um, the makeup artist says, are your ears always so red? And I was like, what are you talking about? And she said, look in the mirror. And I looked in the mirror. It was like they were lit up with LEDs. Uh, it was like Rudolph the Red Nose. I mean, it was like bright red ears. And it was just, I guess, the anxiety of the nerves kicked in. Uh, I'd never felt this way before. And, um, and she said, OK, don't worry. We'll put some makeup on it. So she cakes on some, you know, some makeup and, and pastes it on there. So when I came down, you probably didn't even recognize it. Yeah. But on TV, you can't see how nervous I was. But that was kind of the signal. Right, right. Uh, and I remember uh, with that Letterman show, right, if mm. I may talk about something that, that we had discussed beforehand, mm. he, uh, uh, Steve was super nervous. And I remember reasoning with him, because I had never seen him nervous before. I just ne never, and I'd known him for years by that point. And I, uh, <coughs> you know, I, I said to him, are you going on the Letterman show cold or had Letterman sent uh, bookers in order to watch you, like at the Waldorf. And he said, no, three different times they sent people up over the course of months to watch me perform. And I said, and did they like what they saw? And he said, yeah, of course, they were asking me to be on the show. And I said, well, there you go. Do you think that these bookers are saying, going back to David Letterman and saying, we saw this guy, Steve Cohen, he's pretty good, but maybe if we put him on the show, he'll be better than he is. You know, like maybe he'll up his game a bit. Like, and it's obviously that's not the case. So like who you are when you're doing things normally is who they want on the air. They're not expecting anything better. Yeah. So who you are is enough. Even when you're performing and maybe you get distracted with thoughts, what should I have for dinner or those kinds of things, that's the guy they want performing. Right? And you well, yeah, said when, when Mark said to me, I remember specifically, so we're standing outside the dressing room and, uh, and he said to me, you only have to be as good as you normally are. And that, was, that put me at ease. I was so nervous. But the moment he said that, he said something like, uh, you know, if you're a baseball player and uh, you're going to be traded from one team to the other, the new team doesn't expect you to have a better, uh, you know, uh, batting average than when you're on your old team. So just be as good as you already are. That's, that put me at ease. Right. So you've been on, uh, speaking about being on TV, you've had your own TV special on the History Channel, Lost Magic Decoded. And of course, History Channel. So what Steve did was there were four major illusions, some of which people wondered if they were real. They were legendary illusions and some were dangerous illusions. And so Steve, over the course of months, went around the world to discover, did some of these tricks exist? And if they existed, did people 
people really perform them and what was the history about them. So can you tell us what those tricks were and sure. maybe something surprising that you learned? Sure. Well, the four, the four main uh, tricks in the History Channel show uh, were the Mechanical Turk, which some of you may be familiar with is the automaton that could play chess against a human and win, uh, like from the Edgar Allan Poe uh, uh, story. Uh, also, the light and heavy chest in which Robert Houdin, a famous magician from France, um, stripped away the power of a mighty warrior so he couldn't lift up this tiny little wooden box, even though a small child could lift it up with no troubles. Uh, the next one was the Indian rope trick, uh, which is where the, and I went to India to find a magician who could perform this for me, uh, which is where a rope levitates up 20 or 30 feet into the sky. A little Indian boy climbs up to the top of it, disappears into a cloud of smoke. Uh, and that was trick number three. Uh, trick number four was the bullet catch, uh, which I performed myself and uh, lived to tell the tale because I'm here with you today. The bullet catch. Tell us what the bullet catch is. That was probably the craziest thing that I, I, I have ever attempted. Um, so the bullet catch, as, as you have, may have seen or heard before, is a magic trick where the magician catches a bullet in his or her teeth. And um, so the way that we performed it on the show was it was in a firing range in Brooklyn. Uh, it was... Uh, right, yeah. Why is that funny? I didn't say a firing range in Staten Island. <laughs> Um, and so, so then um, the shooter was, was on the other end. He's a sharpshooter. He has a Glock 19 regulation NYPD pistol. The bullet was marked by an audience member and then fired at my face through a sheet of pane glass. And the reason that the glass is there is because it proves that a projectile is actually moving from point A to point B. Um, otherwise, it could just be a cap gun. So he fires the gun at my face. And then as planned, I catch the bullet in my mouth. However, while we were doing the, photo, the, the video shoot, uh, I felt something else hit me at the same exact time in my chest. And I thought to myself, wait a minute, this can't be two bullets because I only saw one muzzle flash. Like you've never, most of you have probably never been on the <laughs> receiving end <laughs> of a gun, I hope. Um, but but you, know, you see the muzzle flash go off and it wasn't bam, bam, it was just bam, but I felt uh, something hit my chest as I was moving my head back uh, to reveal the bullet. And so I fell to the floor spit the bullet out onto the ground, and started cursing like a sailor. And um, Mark, you know me. Yeah, Steve never curses, never curses. Yeah, I'm a real, I'm a real Boy Scout. Yeah. So, so, um, so I, I was cursing for a specific reason. And it was kind of, an, uh, we hadn't planned this at all because it was not intended. But I, I was doing this in order to signal to the director and to the videographer that there was something wrong. Because they wouldn't know that I wasn't trying to purposely foul up this shot, you know, this video shoot. So, um, so I was just cursing and, and yelling. And I was down on the ground. They realized that there was a problem then because of my actions. And so they ran over an EMT. He cut open my shirt. And uh, that was a big problem for me because it was a brand new Paul Stewart shirt. Brand new shirt. So anyways, so he cuts open the shirt and sees I had a uh, blood tumor, a hematoma, that happened from the glass. When the glass shattered, it was tempered glass, and a piece of the glass, usually you know, tempered glass like a windshield, it beads up upon impact, and then all the pieces fall down. That's what we had rehearsed, and we had done it properly. And then during the live shoot, uh, the bullet uh, makes the glass go off, and then the firing of the glass then hits my chest, and um, it didn't penetrate my chest, but it grazed me, and ended up with this blood tumor that kept on growing. Uh, and for several months, it was this giant saucer-like size of, of, a, of a blood tumor. It kept on changing colors. It was really disgusting. But um, my director then says, oh, we have, to get this, we have to get this all on camera. So the ending of the show is me getting loaded onto a gurney, take, getting taken to the hospital. And, uh, and so while we're in the, in the ambulance, the director of the show is saying, this is wonderful. We have our ending. Right. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm in severe pain. You're thinking, he's like, the network's going to love this. Uh, um, and so, so uh, anyways, so the, what did you ask what I learned from this? I learned never to do that again. Right. Um, that's why I do uh, card tricks, stick to card tricks. Uh, the most dangerous part of my act now is paper cuts. Right, right. Does anyone in the crowd, does anyone have a question for Steve right now? And if you do, if you could go up to the microphone. Yeah, these could be questions about magic. They could be questions yeah. about the history of magic, anything you saw today. Uh, I won't answer any questions that begin, how'd you do it? That's off the table, so don't get any wise ideas. 
Just a quick thing before you get started. Uh, what I forgot to mention at the beginning, there is a graphic novel uh, which is inspired by Steve's life. It features murder and kidnapping and lots of other things. Uh, so you have to get to tell which bits are real and which are not. Um, <laughs> but they'll be for sale at the end, and uh, Steve may be kind enough to autograph a copy. Yeah, actually, yeah. Thanks, thanks for reminding me. So I, I brought up a copy just to flip through this. So uh, this this book is. Uh, I'm very proud of this, which is why I hope that some of you get a chance to read it. Um, it's a comic book of my life, a graphic novel. Uh, the forward was written by David Copperfield. Uh, the artwork is done by artists who work on Daredevil uh, for Marvel and the color current colorer uh, for uh, Batman, uh, her name is Jordi Belair, uh, did the, the coloring. So if you're interested in comic books or graphic novels, I think you might get a real kick out of this. It combines, as Andrew mentioned, some elements of my life and some things that have never happened because I've actually never murdered anybody. Hi, yes, thank please. You so much, thank you so much for the show. It's really great. Uh, I have a question uh, about your thoughts on ma magic in general. Uh, is how does magic evolve uh, with the help of high equip, like high tech equipments or like ele electric device? Uh, are there magicians like creating new tricks uh, by designing and creating the new devices, or uh, magicians tend to do the more traditional way? Uh, great question. So I think that there's still a little bit of both. Um, magicians have always been on the cutting edge of technology. Um, so before technology is often available to the public, magicians have tried to get our hands on that, to be able to have a little bit of an edge against what uh, the, the public is aware even exists. So yes, certainly there has been usage of technology. But personally, because I'm very old school, I like to use many of the old school techniques. Now, uh, having said that, a lot of my research is done with very high um, end technology. Um, there's a beautiful, wonderful library here in New York City called the Conjure Arts Research Center, which sounds like uh, some place out of Hogwarts, but it's a real place here in Manhattan. And the Conjuring Arts Research Center um, actually has scanned optical scanned every page of every book in their library, millions of pages, and these books go date back to the 15th century, maybe even older. Uh, some of the books are so delicate that if you turn the page, they might crumble and all the secrets would vanish. So they're in a, a kind of a climate controlled vault. Anyway, all of the pages have been scanned and then turned through um, uh, scanning technology into searchable PDFs. So if I want to find how to do a new trick or an old trick, I can simply go to the Conjuring Arts Research Center, type in, let's say, trick with an egg or trick with a rope or, or the Indian rope trick, and every instance of that trick will now be at my fingertips instantly. So uh, these are books that are not even available on Google Books or things like this, only because they're proprietary and some of them are still in copyright. Thank you. Over here, yes, miss? Hello. Hi, Hi, Mark. Hi, Steve. I'm Hi. Karina. Thanks Hi. for joining us. Um, Thank you. My colleague asked a very similar question to what I was going to ask. Uh, but first, I wanted to share. I first learned of you, Steve, last week. Uh, my aunt, who lives in California, sent an article, I believe on MSN, if that was out recently or she just found it. Um, and then I came into work the next day and received the email announcement that you would be performing. So that felt very magical. Yeah, I planned that. <laughs> <laughs> I believe you fully. Um, so I wanted to know, you know, you've been performing this show for 20 years, doing magic your whole life. How do you see public interest and reception to magic having evolved? Um, where is it now and, and where do you see it going? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you. So, you know, um, I think that, that magic has evolved in a way that people are now watching more of it on their screens. Um, you know, we can, if you're interested in magic on your lunch break, you can open up uh, YouTube and watch endless number of YouTube videos of either of magic tricks or even magic tutorials teaching you how to do tricks. Um, and in a way, that's beautiful. Because in that sense, you can, as a magician, reach a massive new audience. But from my personal perspective, I think that magic needs to be something that people say, it happened to me. I need, to be, I need my audience to say, I was the one who was on the receiving end personally. So in my mind, I think it's always best to see a magic show live. Um, of course, you know, from a business perspective, you can reach more people uh, you know, with a massive audience, but that smaller one-to-one uh, -one, you know, screen, it's, it's really, it, it, you just never really match that in a live audience, a live perspective. Um, also, um, when you're dealing with, with uh, the ability to Google anything, uh, for instance, you could even Google secrets, right? So let's say you watch a magic show. I actually have magician colleagues who they have told me horror stories that they're performing, let's say, at a bar mitzvah party or they're performing at a wedding. And the, while they're performing their close-up magic, someone from the table or someone in that audience will take out their phone and start Googling that trick 
the methodology while the trick is actually being performed to them. So in real time, someone's trying to decipher how the trick is done. Like, oh, okay. And I think that the way that magicians can beat that um, is number one, by uh, not using the names of the tricks in their presentation. So like, as Mark mentioned before, tricks have names. So for example, if a trick is called the ambitious card, if I say, well, I'm going to show you my ambitious card routine, then anyone now can say, okay, how does ambitious card work? Because that's the title that they just heard. So you can come up with cockamamie titles uh, as a magician to throw people off the scent. Another way to do it really is to to try to find old tricks that haven't been seen for a long time. Uh, for those of you who have been to my show, you might have seen the trick called Think a Drink, uh, which is where I have a silver tea kettle that pours almost any drink you could ask for all around the room, one by one by one. Everyone drinks their favorite cocktail or their favorite drink, and uh, people go crazy. And then, of course, I know they go back home, and the first thing they do is Think a Drink, Google, how's it done? And, um, and, and fortunately, most of the articles that are out there are ones that I've written myself. <laughs> Uh, about not how the trick is done, but um, but how the trick came to be and the history of it. Because I think that you know there's there's art appreciation courses, right? Uh, but there's really no magic appreciation course. So if anything, what I've tried to do on my own blog uh, is to give people the chance to find out about the history of where these tricks came from, and hopefully you can appreciate it better that way. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Well, let's do one more, and then you'll show us that final trick. Should we do it? Yeah, but let's have this young lady. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, Steve, thank you so much for being here. I celebrated my birthday at one of your shows a few years ago. So thank you. Thank you. Big fan. Um, my question has to deal with like uh, the the magic industry in general and kind of the future of that. So somewhere in the same vein, but we see like a lot of men are magicians, right? Uh, we don't really see too many female magicians. But I know from your show and talking to you before. Your daughter is a magician, correct? She's, yeah, she's been learning, yes. Yeah, and do you see yourself like kind of pushing her in that direction to maybe taking over what you've started or like mentoring her to where she really can have her own niche in the industry? Oh, that's a, that's a really great question. Yeah, there's far too few female magicians. Um, my daughter, her name is June, she's a wonderful dancer and and comedian and uh, she's just a she has great stage presence when she gets on a, on stage so what we did is uh, we've we've done on Father's Day weekend a double act where she'll come on and she'll do a mental mentalism mind reading trick that really is it, it kills she's she's really phenomenal at it so um, so I really have encouraged that and it's also very endearing to see a father and a daughter work together on stage uh, so so we've done that act before and my son uh, is not as much of a magician he's more of a soccer player so he has sleight of foot rather than sleight of hand um, but but to answer your question I, I see more and more female magicians at magic clubs and at magic meetings. There's you know organizations of magicians. I'm a member of the uh, Magic Circle in London, uh, where there are numerous more. It used to be an all male organization. Then they opened up the uh, the uh, membership to females, and there are now plenty of, of female magicians. Not enough, but more and more. And I think that um, that's something that may be the next generation, the, the next uh, evolvement of magic. You know, if you look at, there's a great book, um, it was called The Chalice and the Blade by uh, Iliade, you, you know, you must know this. Yeah, sure. and, uh, and she talks about how, you know, it's a, f a feminist uh, history book. So it talks about how the earliest magicians were uh, female, um, shamans in, in early societies because think about it what can a woman do that a man can't do which is create something from nothing right so that's a very magical act and over the course of centuries then that magical power got taken away from female to male and of course all of the theatrical magicians that we see mostly are male uh, regardless I think that there's a real opening there for the clever female magicians in the future thank you so much so that uh that next trick, that final trick, and should we get someone up on stage? To oh help yeah, you let's do that. Yes, yeah, so maybe we can what? get um, actually the lady who was here for her birthday. Why don't she? She should come back up. The lady who came from the birthday community, she can come on stage, and then maybe we can get one more person over here. So um, yeah, with the fellow over here, he seems like he's eager. Maybe too eager. Yeah, he's over here. Very good. And the lady can come over here. Wonderful. And I think we should get the camera on here so people who are on the sides can see everything a little bit better. And why don't you come a little bit closer over here? And you can come in a lot closer over here. Uh, not too close. Right there is good. Good. And um, can we get the cameras so people can see? Wonderful. Then we're ready to begin. And I don't know your name? Audrey. Audrey and? I'm John. John. Very good. Ta da. Okay. Can you please rub my hand? Make sure it's empty. Yeah, <laughs> 
breakfast magic trick. Yeah. Who is this guy? Who let him in here? Yeah, Very good. good. All right, terrific. Thank you for doing that. And I'm going to cover up the hand. And now that you're uh, here, can you please uh, touch my thumb? Right? You feel the thumb? Yeah. Now hop over to my pointer finger. That's number two, then number three, number four, and number five. Did you touch all five fingers? Good. Now I need you to put out two fingers like this, Audrey, and please touch my palm. So you feel my palm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So those of you who are watching can't feel what they felt, but this is what they felt, my palm. <laughs> okay. Watch very closely. In the palm of my hand. Look, it's getting taller and taller. It's starting to rise and take form. Audrey, I hope that you're thirsty because it's time for a single malt scotch. Oh. Happy birthday again. Oh, thank, you. thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy. Enjoy. Thank you so much. Steve Cohen, the millionaire's magician. I'm Mark Levy, and the show is Chamber Magic. Thank you very much.